Hello, and welcome to the Uncommon Commander channel, a channel dedicated to making fun, janky deck techs. Sometimes that jank involves Pauper EDH, and today is one of those days. Pauper is an inexpensive format, allowing us to build fairly competitive decks for the format at a reasonably low price. Today's deck is coming in at just about $30. Now, I've been neglecting the Pauper crowd, and I kind of feel bad about that, so I'm very happy to introduce for your enjoyment this flying tribal deck built around the protective owl Essior, Wardwing Familiar, and her lovely master, Radiant Sarah Archangel. I find it a little odd that she's a Sarah Archangel and yet doesn't have vigilance like, you know, the regular old Sarah Angel does. Maybe that would have pushed her into rare territory instead of uncommon? I don't know. But let's look past that little snafu by Wizards of the Coast and look at what our commanders do bring to the table. We're first going to want to get Essior on the table, as Essior is a 2-mana 1-3 flying bird, and has spells your opponent's cast that target one or more commanders you control cost three more to cast. That is some excellent spot removal protection for Essior, and also for Radiant. Essior is a bit unheralded in this deck, as you can't notice the spot removal that isn't used against you, but Essior does free us up to run a bare minimum of protection spells, so we get more fuel in each draw, so maybe you'll notice that as you play instead. Looking at Radiant, we have a 7-mana 6-4 Flying Angel that has Tap another untapped creature you control with flying. Radiant Sarah Archangel gains protection from the color of your choice until the end of the turn, which is even more protection, though only for Radiant. That's okay though, because in a format where commander damage is lethal at 16 instead of 21, Radiant is just about the equivalent of an Elder Dragon, and this Elder Dragon is going to be harder to remove than an Ascetic Avacyn. Okay, maybe not as hard as that, but nearly so. Another nice thing about protection is that, while it is obviously a way to foil removal spells, it is also a great evasion ability, as creatures can't block something that has protection from them. Swinging at a mono black player? Just tap a flying creature and name black, then swing in unimpeded. As a warning, there are some auras that buff Radiant in this deck. Be careful when giving her protection if she's got an aura on her. If she has a white aura on her and you give her protection from white, her aura will fall off and go to the graveyard. Because of this, Radiant is a bit stronger against red, green, and black than she is against blue and especially white decks. The plan with this deck is to cast cheap flying creatures, cast Radiant, and start winning. We have some stuff in here to buff her up into two-shot territory, and if we're lucky, into one-shot territory. This is a simple deck that protects its primary win condition jealously, and it's perfect for those who are sick of all the fancy chicanery of the decks they see online and just want to smash someone's face in. Probably the face of the guy who says chicanery. As usual, we'll want to start by ramping in the early turns. This deck is a little bit interesting when it comes to ramp. Like most popper decks, we're fairly low to the ground for our average converted mana cost, but Radiant herself costs 7 mana. You'll see here that we begin by casting land ramp, mana rocks, and cost reducers. Those are Wayfarer's Bauble, Arcane Signet, Mindstone, Azorius Cluestone, Azorius Locket, Bonder's Ornament, Commander's Sphere, Orazka Relic, Stormscape Familiar, and Warden of Evos Isle. Many of these have additional utility, like drawing us cards. Those last two are flying creatures as an added bonus. Now, once we've gotten one or two of these out, along with a few lands, it's time to drop a burst of mana down with Energy Tap or High Tide. These will allow us to hopefully get Radiant out early, as early as turn 4 if we're lucky. If you can get her out that early, she's going to do some serious damage. To get Radiant protection, we can cast Essior. To give her even more protection, and to give us an evasive army of chip damagers, we can cast low-priced flying creatures. These are going to be Artificer's Assistant, Fairy Guide Mother, which doubles as a way to get Radiant up to the magic number of 8 power for a turn, Fairy Seer, Fairy Squadron. Dewdrop Spy, as you can tell, we'd really love our fairies in this deck. Skywatcher Adept, which can grow to be a very useful creature all on its own. Augury Owl, and Rise of Eagles. Now that we've got Radiant Doubt and the small flyers that are making her even harder to remove and block than she already was, it's time to see if we can't shave her ability to 3-shot an opponent down to 2-shots instead. We'll start with an equipment and a few auras. Again, be careful with these auras. If they're attached to Radiant, when you name their color, they will fall off her. First up, we have the equipment Jousting Lance, which will give her first strike during our turn. We then have the aura's Lunark Mantle, one with the wind, dub, candlelight vigil, and marked by honor. Each of these gives plus two to her power, getting her to the magic number of eight. 
Another much more fleeting way to get Radiant up to 8 power is through instants. These all work as combat tricks, though most of them do have other utility as well. These are Piracy Charm, Karameter's Blessing, Adamant Will, and Skillful Lunge. This seems like it's about the right time to speak about our other win condition in this deck. I know I promised a simple deck that is meant to smash face with a big evasive commander and a bunch of tiny flying creatures, but there is one infinite combo in this deck. That said, it's not a game-winning infinite combo. Let me show you it, and you'll see what I mean. The necessary cards for this combo are Ornithopter, which on its own is just a nice low-cost flyer for the deck. In this combo, it combines with one of Banishing Knack or Retraction Helix, and with Midnight Guard, the first of only two non-flying creatures in this deck. With those three parts, you have an infinite enter the battlefield loop. On its own, that's pretty useless, but if we add in either the beautifully illustrated Answered Prayers, a card I'm glad I finally found a place for as a Sub McKinnon fan, and Griffin Protector, baby, we've got a stew going. Answered Prayers will give you as much life as you deem fit. Let's say 38,967,384,095. And Griffin Protector will get pumped to whatever total you want him pumped to. Let's say 38 billion, 967 million. <sighs> well, you get the point. Infinite life won't win the game for you, but it will put you out of reach of pretty much everything except commander damage or infect damage. An infinite power creature will kill someone in one hit unless they can block it. The only evasion Griffin Protector has is flying, so it's likely that a lot of people will still be able to block him. Anyway, this is a four card infinite combo that doesn't win the game on the spot. If that isn't jank, I just don't know what is. Now with that combo in mind, we do have some transmute cards that make it easier to assemble and use. Those are Dizzy Spell, Drift of Phantasms, and Crook Claw Transmuter. All three of these pieces are useful on their own. Really, I'd recommend only trying to assemble the Ornithopter combo if you have Ornithopter and two other pieces of it in your hand already, or Ornithopter and ways to find two other pieces. At that point, maybe just tuck it away in your hand and hope you draw into the final piece later. Otherwise, just use the pieces on their own. Now that you've seen how the deck wins, it's important to show how it prevents itself from losing. The time has come to remove our opponent's threats. We've got lots of removal, and it comes in several flavors. We're going to start by showing our counter spells. Those are Arcane Denial, Lofty Denial, and Spell Stutter Sprite. Lofty Denial is great in concert with Essior, making it so that an opponent would have to pay 8 mana for a simple unsummon spell. Spell Stutter Sprite is basically a force spike on a body if you don't already have other fairies on the board, and is better than that if there are other fairies in play. She acts as a great surprise blocker, or as a surprise color protection for Radiant. Our actual spot removal is fairly diverse. For enchantments and or artifacts, we're running Aura Blast, Disenchant, Shinewind, and Dismantling Blow, which can double as card draw if you've got the mana for it. Our removal that can hit creatures as well are Echoing Truth, Gust of Wind, and Scour from Existence. Scour can actually target a troublesome land as well, which makes me okay with slotting it in here in spite of its 7 mana cost. All of these spells are great, but none of them are very useful unless they're in our hand. Aside from the ancillary card draw we've already seen, we have these spells specifically here to refuel our hand. Some of these cards require us to attack to draw. Those are Ophidian Eye, Tandem Lookout, Impaler Shrike, and Last Thoughts. Spells we very simply need to cast in order to draw are Winged Words, 4C, and Mole Drifter. The final card draw spell is Sphinx's Disciple. He synergizes nicely with Radiant as she can tap him to give her self-protection from the color of your choice, and when he untaps, he draws you a card. A nice little card per turn engine. Due to us wanting to get Radiant out as quickly as possible, it's important that we play a fast mana base, which means we don't run too many tap lands. Those that we do run are the Cycling Lands. Drifting Meadow, Remote Isle, Secluded Steep, and Lonely Sandbar. We're running these because there is a point at which we simply won't need all the mana we're able to produce, and these can be ditched in the hopes of finding a spell instead. The rest of our non-basics are the Utility Land, Cave of Temptation, which helps Radiant reach 8 power when it's sacrificed, and the Color Fixing Lands, Ash Barrens, and Command Tower. Our basic lands in this deck are 16 islands and 13 planes. Alright everyone, you've made it through 95 cards of the deck and are no doubt desperate to see what I view as the 5 most impactful cards because my opinion is just so important. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to... The Final Countdown! Since I've got you on the hook, I think I'll drag this out a little bit longer by talking a lot while saying nothing. 
When I was a boy, I always wanted to do a countdown segment. It was my dream, my life's ambition, my raison de- Ah, shoot. Looks like Baron Mount Count is giving me the signal to move on. <sighs> Very well. At number five, we have a card that is a type of board wipe. Its name is Patrician Scorn, and it destroys all enchantments. We're running some enchantment auras, so be careful not to use this at the wrong time. But otherwise, this thing is a common level card that is also an instant and will usually cost zero mana. That's pretty incredible. Our number four card is a draw spell that doesn't actually guarantee any draws. You see, betrayal is contingent on an opponent tapping their creature that it's attached to, but it has the low entry fee of one mana, meaning that if your opponent causes you to draw a single card, it will have paid for itself. Put this on an early mana dork and you're almost guaranteed a card or two out of it. If you instead put it on an opponent's big threat that they want to swing at you with, they'll either be giving you cards or you'll have stopped from turning sideways to attack you. Either way, that's a win. Our number three card costs a lot of mana, but it is the biggest draw spell in the deck and it'll almost always be worth it. Rush of Knowledge is going to refill our hands based on the highest CMC permanent that we control. Well, one of our commanders has seven CMC, that means we're getting an entire new hand for 5 mana. Even in EDH, that's a pretty good rate, to say nothing of Pauper. Remember Griffin Protector? Remember how he will help us win the game as long as you can get him through? Well, our number 2 card is going to try to help with that. Skyblind Staff, combined with the flying ability, effectively makes your creature that it's attached to unblockable. That works great on Radiant, too. Two-shotting an opponent is nice, but why two-shot someone when you can one-shot them instead? At number 1, we have Spring Jack Knight, who has you clash with an opponent when you attack with him, and gives double strike to a target creature if you win that clash. Now I must warn you, this guy has a toughness of 1, and requires that we attack with him in order to use his ability. Unless you're playing against a zombie, you're only getting one chance with this card, so when you swing with Spring Jack Knight, you had better also be swinging with Radiant. There are also a few scry cards in here as well, to help ensure that you at least have a card with a CMC on top of your library. If you're successful and Radiant is at 8 power, this will allow you to one-shot the person you're attacking. This is janky as heck, but it is game-winning when it works. So congratulations, you've just janked off all over your friends with your Radiant creature. Maybe apologize for finishing so quickly, but otherwise, enjoy the victory. Well, it's that time where I thank you for watching this video and ask you to click the like button and subscribe to the channel so you can catch our future content. I'd also love if you left a comment letting me know if you enjoy the Pauper EDH content, and if you do, I'll try to keep making more of it. Now then, I'm going to go buy some more magic cards with all the money I save by making a pauper deck this week. I'll see you next time, friends.